Hello, this is George Collias, and uh, it's great to be back on the Drum Talk, and uh, this time I have some great things to show you. Hey George, thanks for coming back to Drum Talk. And since this is a special and not a regular episode, it will be a little different. We will focus on what's new in your drumming life, but also talk about a few different things as well. So let's get into the thing. What have you been cooking the last few years? It's been four years, but I don't think all four years count because we had the, the COVID situation, you know? So some uh, projects left behind a little bit and, um, you know, some ideas were thrown on the table. It took a while, you know. So anyways, the idea was to design a pedal that will, will be the pedal for all the extreme stuff and also for different styles. We did it. I got it right here. Okay. Yep. Yeah, then let the cat out of the bag, please. Okay, Sorry. you wanna see it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's the one. This is it. Uh, it took a lot of um, emails, you know, talking about real details, talking about how you know, how high the football will be. You know, all this, uh, like the bitter angle, how tight we can go for extreme stuff. Yeah. It's rather go to the start. Yeah. You have been approached by Pearl Drums to yeah. design a pedal. Yeah. This is actually something we were talking for years. And we just decided to go with it. That was it. Uh, Pearl is, everybody knows, is my family. You know, everything I play is Pearl, except the pedals a few months ago. So now we, we did it all. So yeah, I have the demon drive and I, I see the similarities. There are similarities, yeah. What this actually is, is a boosted demon drive. So we, we took the bottom half of the demon drive because the bottom half doesn't count. You know, it just stays in the ground, you know, attached to the kick drum, you know, whatever. But the top half has to be light, has to be smooth, you know, the board has to be, you know, so it allows a little bit of more movement, you know? You know, we needed a new beater for sure, the spring. There, there are so many little details, like lighter material stuff, like these, you know, everything you see in red is lighter than usual. It looks beautiful, but it looks like something can be done like really quick. No, no, there was a lot of parts. Even this, the, the beater holder, I had uh, four versions. I wasn't trying only for metal stuff. Metal stuff, yeah, okay, this works, that angle works great. But what if the footboard is here and the beater is here, then if you want the beater back, you have to go like really high, that affects the precision on the pedal. It makes the pedal louder sometimes. But anyways, I tried different styles and we ended up with the best part, which is this. Trust me, if you try this, you're gonna love it. Can you tell me what it was like for you when you were switching from a traditional pedal to those modern pedals, yep. those high-tech ones, and now switching from one company to another? Well, yeah, I was playing chain drives forever. I wish I knew better because I really like the belt drives nowadays. How old were you when you were uh, switching from I, the traditional? I think it was like 20, 23, where I got, uh, when, when I first went direct drive. You know, all my favorite drummers did, you know, back then. Uh, every drummer I was admiring, you know, they were playing direct drive pedals. Uh, so I did as well. I, of course, I noticed a difference, you know, we're talking about like a direct drive, it's more direct, you know, it's more like, a, it's quicker, it feels lighter, it feels more responsive. Yeah, I mean, I got used to what I was playing for years and, you know, I was very happy, but this is the next step. This is like something we develop with uh, my, 20 year experience of touring live, playing this extreme type of music. What I wanted was like something that works for all this stuff, but also for my other stuff. Because when I play funk or jazz, I want the same pedal. And not necessarily in the studio, but when I do a clinic or something and I have to play like swing or something, you know, I have the same pedal. And I wanted, I wanted it to look as good as it plays. 
you know. And this, I mean, I mean, look at that. <laughs> it's beautiful, you know. We were watching the other day video shots from the top of the kit, and I gotta tell you, man, you know, that change, you know, the, having the, the new pedals, I, I love it, seriously. What limitations of former pedals you used did you try to overcome with this construction? Not really. Um, we could, we could, but here's a catch. There are many pedals out there with um, 3,424 settings, okay? Which is not funny. And people are like confused and they're, you know, they, they buy this and they're like, how do I set it up, you know? And seriously, like, the more settings you give to drummers, the more you get them confused and the more you take the opportunity of having them like a perfectly set up pedal. That's why, for example, like some pedals in the past, they just worked. And people, some people are still stuck to pedals that they were made in um, the 70s, right? Because they were simple and they worked, okay? So that's what we try to do here. As less settings as possible, keep it as simple as possible, but when you take it out of the box, it works. And actually a very famous drummer, he sent me a message and he said, I took it out of the box, and I was ready to do a show. He was very happy. So the goal was not to build like a, something from Mars with a, a amazing settings, something that will cost actually the company a lot of money and will not help the drummers. So we went the, the, the opposite direction. We wanted something as simple as possible to keep like the weight on the perfect way, to have the, 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 the perfect spring. In the box, we include also a different spring, like a normal spring as well. So if you want to play like a blues, and you don't feel comfortable with this tight spring, the heavy duty spring, you use the other spring. So we have some extra in the box just to um, help everybody, which is mental actually, because this spring works. You just loosen it up a little bit and it's perfect. Remember, you told me that there was a PDF, yeah, I 20 got it. page kind of thing. <laughs> was it with your input, like all the stuff yes. you think a new pedal should yes. or could have? So can you uh, go a little bit more detail in, yeah. in that direction? I did some designs and I was working with uh, the department in Japan. I was thinking something like this. I, I drop a lot of ideas and uh, most of them, they, they, they were done. Some of them wouldn't work as well or we'll make uh, the whole thing like too complicated and we really try hard to keep it simple. Uh, when I saw the first designs, try to switch the beat a little bit, you know, just try to do a, a few different things. Uh, the sheets, they didn't show a picture of a pedal. I mean, obviously, yeah. Like I said, I designed the whole thing, but it has nothing to do with the final thing. I was just trying to explain to Japan, like, okay, I was thinking something like that. But there's a lot of numbers. The footboard height, the beater angle, the beater angle compared to the footboard height. Like, if you want the, the footboard height, like, really low, then the beater is here. Well, of course, you can move it from this, you can set it up, like, being here, while the, you know, but yeah. I, I told them what I want. And everybody who played my pedals, everybody complains, oh, this is too tough. I can't really even push it down because of the spring. 10 minutes later, guess what? They love it. I know how to set up a pedal. Yes, the, the spring is extreme, but all the angle, like I said, you know, the, the footboard angle gives me that feel to push the pedal, you know, like to the extreme speeds. But when I saw the board, the, this design, that was completely different from what I had in mind. So I think the board, you know, these angles here makes it look very aggressive. The funny story with, uh, the Japanese guys, you know, the, the, the hardware developing department, you know, uh, he asked for pictures of my motorcycle just to get ideas. I'm like, man, that's getting more cool every day. You know, it's, it's super cool. I like everything like, uh, for example, uh, some people might not notice, but I have some prototypes and they're different than these. I mean, the, the, the shape is the same, but these screws here or these that they come from the back, uh -huh to keep the, the heel block, yeah. but they're visible. 
and you can touch them, you know, like it, little details, you know, to, to make it a little bit more special. We decided to keep these from the Demon Drive because there is a lot of technology and design and it's there. I mean, why redesign the bottom part of the pedal? There is no reason. Maybe we'll make it look a little bit more new or something, but like I said, you know, killer parts of a pedal, you keep and then you try to improve a little bit and, you know, offer something a little bit different on the top half. Like I said, you know, as the name says, you know, that's a, that's a Demon pedal, but uh, on steroids. This is a Demon on steroids, yeah. The Demon XR. Funny story, my favorite motorcycle is called Honda XR. And I, did, I had zero input on the name. So finally they're like, okay, we named the pedal Demon XR. I'm like, <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. Yeah. So I'm 100% happy with, the, with, the, with all the design. You see this? This is the adjustment for the hoop clamp. You can adjust this part over here with this. But this is on my pedal. When you buy the pedal, it comes with the butterfly nut, they call it, right? The normal butterfly thing that everybody's used to it. But for me, because I have the remote hi-hat, if you see my kit, it's uh, the right pedal, remote hi-hat, and then a double pedal that hits my third kick drum right now, which is a 16-inch kick drum. So that screw, for every pedal was always in the way. And now we include this little screw that you can get the butterfly nut out, which goes like, I think up to here and save some space. That's one practical detail from a drummer who tours and he's like, man, I hate this screw. I hate this nut, it's, it's always in the way, okay? I talked to some friends, I'm like, man, I had this idea to get rid of, you know, all the, the extension, you know, uh, butterfly nuts, you know, whatever. And they were like, oh, finally. So everybody liked the idea of my close friends. I'm like, yeah, we should, we should include it. I would say one of the highlights of this pedal will be the beater, the redesigned beater. It looks very modern, it sounds great. One small detail, but we have to actually try two versions. One version was like this, like, like, you know, the one we have right here. The other one, the beater was like that, a little bit on the sideway. So that means when you hit the kick head, then all the surface will land on the drum head, which in a way, it sounds better. But on another way, it gets a little bit of the rebound out. But I was like, okay, if we don't touch the whole skin, we can probably don't get stuck on the head and get like a quicker rebound. And, uh, but either way, both, both of them sounded great. So we went with this one. Now let's talk about the material. Yeah. It has to be light in weight because you don't want to have too yeah. much to carry around. It has to be very endurant. So tell me about the material and what you've tried. Well, we, we have this uh, brass aluminum, which that's, you know, adds all the beauty on a pedal. Like most modern pedals, they give a lot of emphasis, you know, on the board, you know, the, the, the material and, you know, to be shiny and allow like some, some movement, you know, while you're playing. Like I said, the base plate, the base of the pedal, um, did you ever had this, like set up your pedal? like the, the, the light pedal, and then when you play the kick drum, the pedal jumps up and down? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I like the heavier bottom. But then what you feel when you play, you don't feel the bottom, you feel the top. And this is lighter aluminum, these two pieces here. Um, obviously this one, also super thin, to keep the, the weight as less as possible. But I tried almost every pedal out there. Some of them, they look amazing. A lot of, like, it's a piece of art, and then you try to play it and it feels like, I mean, they look good, but the, the, the feel is not there. It's, it's not there. Some others are extra light, that you feel there is no pedal. And... Um, yeah, that's the worst for me. I, yeah, exactly, because I play with, with the rebound, that swing we were talking about, you know, like, um, I usually give this example, like, you have a basketball and you play, you're not pushing it down, you're pushing it and you're throwing it back. You know, the, the feel is like you 
kind of like throwing it back, right? That's what I want. I want that swing. I want to feel the weight center like up there, but light. Um, not so light, but going tight with the spring, you make it lighter. So you kind of move the weight center. So I want to feel like I'm throwing the beater when I play super fast. If I play blues, doom, cut, doom, doom. Yeah, okay, whatever. Just, I can kick the, <laughs> the kick drum, you know, with my, with my shoe and I still can play. But for the extreme stuff, I want to feel that detail, like throwing the beater to the head and grabbing it back again. You know, that, I call it the swing, yeah. swing. What does that pedal offer a drummer that's not really interested in this extreme stuff? I'll tell you what. Uh, first of all, it's accurate as hell. Number two, it's super silent. It reads the motion. You know, the direct drive makes a, a huge difference. You know, it's up to you. Like, do you want a pedal that you're thinking of something and you play it? Or you want a pedal that, the chain drive, for example, right? If you want to try to play a little bit faster. And that can be a feel. Da -da -dum -dum. Okay. Well, now these, the faster you go, the chain just bounces. If you see this slow motion, it, it doesn't listen. The pedal doesn't listen. You're like, hey man, you give me too much information. The direct drive will do. So listen, good hardware is a must for a drummer. Like for example, yeah, you know what? I don't play rock music. Why should I get a nice uh, uh, boom stand? Because it's stable, because you know, because it's, you know, you're secure that you know, I will do as many shows and it will still be there serving my needs. It's, it's so accurate. The, the direct drive pedals are so accurate that uh, to me, although it's not a new technology, very soon everybody will play direct drives because it's the way to go. The tighter you go, the more speed you gain, but you lose control. The more loose you go here, you got perfect control. Everything is fine. It feels like butter smooth but you don't have speed. So for me, I went with the first direction, like go like tie the shit, develop more control when I want to play different stuff. Or grooving and play like um, super smooth and light with the, the spring like this. It took years, but I'm telling you, if I can challenge you right now, you're a drummer. If I set it up a little bit different and you play this, this is butter smooth. This is like super smooth pedal. That pedal is probably aimed at pedal nerds, of course. Like everybody. Yeah, but I mean, it's also those people who can afford to buy more and more pedals because now the prices for some of those new pedals is like beyond 2,000 euros. No, 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 which not, is, not which on is this insane. One. I know this is uh, this is not that expensive. That was a crucial thing. Like we really insisted, you know, we, we insist like to keep the price as low as possible. Everything, of course, you know, it's a little bit more expensive nowadays. The question is, uh, how was the price, the affordability part of the development process uh, regarding materials and uh, what have you? It's an X amount of thousand uh, dollars, which I don't want to know, to be honest. It's not easy. It's not easy. But I think boring some of the parts, like the bearings and the plate, it dropped the cost a little bit for us, for the company. But that doesn't mean that this is like, okay, you make a prototype and then you're like, okay, let's, you know, that, man, there's, there's a lot of, I think it's thousands of dollars. I don't want to know, to be honest. <laughs> uh, but I think we did the best to keep the cost low for the company, but also for the, for the drummers out there, you know, because you said it right. Like um, people want to buy pedals and, it, you know, it's like one of the main tools, especially for a metal drummer, right? And I know metal drummers who switch, I don't know, like 10 different pairs or 10 double pedals until they find something that, like, okay, that's, that's the thing, that's, that's my pedal. I know everybody can invest in pedals. I was one of them, you know, I tried many pedals. So I think the price is super fair, uh, especially like, yeah, like you said today, like there are some super expensive pedals, custom made, whatever, you know, like I've, I've seen everything. I think people will be very happy, very happy. This, this is like, a, it worth every penny. It's not too expensive. There's a lot of designing in here. And we did it together. 
it's very, very important to have a drummer on the development, you know, and not like somebody who doesn't play drums, like, oh, I designed the pedal. Yeah, what, what you will buy. Go to the stores and try this baby out. As soon as you put your foot and try to swing a little bit the beater, you'll be like, man, this is super, super smooth. Keep in mind, Pearl is making pedals more than, you know, you ever lived so far, you know? So, you know, we're talking about a lot of years. Uh, they know how to do stuff. I think I helped a little bit too, but this is like, uh, it's um, a result of a lot of love for what we do. And uh, I think it's gonna have a great success. I love it. The question is, when was the last time you did something for the first time? For the first time? Sim racing. That's what I did. Uh, oh, wow. I just built a sim racing, uh, technically a car in the house. And you go there and you increase your heart rate per minute. It's beautiful. Oh, man. It's racing without uh, the risk to get injured. Yeah. And um, I love it. Yeah, that's my new thing. <laughs> yeah, sim racing in a daily basis. Well, I thought maybe you say uh, designing a pedal. <laughs> <laughs> Now let's get to something entirely different. Yeah. And maybe not so much, because you said during the last four years, you were obviously busy in some sort of way. Yeah. But at the same time, what did the situation of our epidemic did to your creativity? Absolutely nothing. Nothing? No. It actually raised the bar big time. I spent the first six months of uh, the pandemic I mean, obviously I wasn't happy. It wasn't cool for anybody because we were, everybody was questioning, like, what do we do? I mean, this thing is serious, are we gonna die? Like, it was a weird period, but um, I remember the, the stay at home thing, for me was a bless. I took a lot of time off from, in general for, uh, you know, uh, everything. And I was in my studio, which thankfully, I was one of the lucky ones to have the studio in my house. Actually, I had two studios, the drum room and the guitar, bass, whatever room, you know? So I wrote um, in six, six months, I think I wrote like 22 brass songs. What else? I wrote some metal songs. So I was, man, I was playing music all day. After this thing was a little bit more stable, bands will contact me and I, I started doing some session work. It was a tough period, I'm not gonna lie. But um, for me, I kept my sanity because I never had enough time home. And finally, I found some time, and I did so many things. Yeah, I mean, art is a good compensation for desperation or bad times. So most artists, on the one hand, were in yeah. a bad place because they couldn't perform and do stuff, yes. but doing it for the sake of it. Yeah. I mean, most artists would do what they do, yeah. uh, even though they didn't get paid for it, right? Yeah. I mean, Right. Still, art helps if you are in a bad place. So this is why most artists, I ask this question, they're, they're like, yeah. yeah I think many, many of us really fucked up that period. I remember the streaming, like, oh, let's go live, Zoom, blah, blah, blah. And you know, they were like rehearsing and doing whatever. Many of them never thought that they were dropping their value. Like, oh yeah, we'll perform for free because we're, we're home and you know, and their value went like, Phew. it was tricky, it was tricky. I suffered too. I didn't get paid for two years. Uh, the government, nobody, nobody was helping. I did some session work because I like to work and because I built this for like 19 years. It doesn't come like overnight, right? And we did some Zoom session talking with the fans and you know, I, I loved it. You know, we had a great time to connect with our fans and get questions, all the band, but I didn't want to go out there and perform for free because um, you, you just dropping your value. It wasn't really smart. I did some free stuff for my companies. It's, it's totally different, but go out there and hang out and rehearse and people watching me, uh, no, you don't want to do it.
this is an awesome segue to a question that is in my mind okay. for so many years now. Because I'm, I'm working as a freelancer, video mm -hmm. guy, and, and from the beginning, one of my questions was, what's my worth? What's the value of my work? And how do I make others understand it? And what are the risks of buckling and those of staying strong? Well, if you go to online, and uh, you type George Collier's net worth. I'm estimated two to five million. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the way to discover what you're worth <coughs> is like, because we as musicians, we lose work because we charge too much. So one band, one artist, whatever, you can say like, oh man, I can't pay this, this much, you know. So you lose some work and you might get some work if you're very cheap, but then you're very cheap. That means you will always stay cheap or around the cheap area. So <clears throat> what I did, I think um, I was always very honest. I did some free work when I was young um, for bands that um, most of them didn't appreciate it very much. Uh, they thought it was normal. I never asked for money, but I got studio experience. It was an amazing thing. When I joined Nile, I had like 50 albums on my back already. For, you know, for smaller bands, professional bands in Greece, whatever, but there was a lot of studio work. So I was in the studio working with the click and record with the producer, you know? So I think that was priceless. But then, you know, de depending on how much you grow as a name, and um, if you invest on your studio, that's a very important thing, right? So you can't ask for like a crazy amount of money, for example, if you don't have something to offer. For example, I do a session. You get paid, you invest in your studio, better mics, you know, better whatever, you know, like better gear in general, mixers, some uh, preamps and uh, plugins and all this stuff. So um, for me, working as a session guy, you know, I was always investing in my studio. And finally, I'm to a point that we record Nile there and drums sound amazing. So it's not only putting your name or even your art, you know, like I can play A good or B good, you know, whatever. It's the whole package, you know, like uh, I got my studio, I don't charge for these extra, you know, so. And then, like I said, you know, you charge, um, you, can, you can tell, like, if you give like a price, people will get it like this. If you give like another price, like maybe higher, a lot higher, people will be like, that's too much. So then you're somewhere in between. <laughs> it's simple. <laughs> no, for me, I charge, I think normal, but I dedicate a lot of time. So if I do like a session uh, album, I got to study the music, I got to make the click drugs, I got to tune the kit, I got to, you know, mic position, like everything. It's, it's a process that takes like a month or a month and a half, depends on the band. I want to sound, that's always a goal. I want to sound like the best drummer for that style, which of course, it doesn't happen, you know. Like for example, if you play hard rock, I will go study Bon Jovi. Be like, okay, what Tico Torres does? Okay, that's cool. I will get the great elements and try to sound like him. So there is a lot of study, you know. It takes, it takes days, you know. People think you just sit on the kit and you play. I wish it was like that, but it's not. As a professional musician, you have to be able to play different roles. Yep. You're either a member of a band and you work as a commissioned artist, like you just described, mm -hmm. that you do session work. How do you serve the different demands of your profession? The same attitude, I guess. Like, when, listen, when it comes to the band, you give it 100%. That means I will leave home for a month and a half, like, you know, seven weeks or something, and go to support our new album or something, you know, like our, our work in general. Or when it comes time for the studio, it's painful. You give everything you have. Just because this is like, this is your dream. This is like uh, the, the main thing, like, you know, the, your main focus. Uh, for session work, you know, I'm dedicated uh, to, you know, 100% dedicated, but I have to listen to other people, right? And, you know, like serve other people's dream. That doesn't make it less fun. It's actually more exciting sometimes because I have to study the style and be like, okay, um, I play hardcore. My relationship with hardcore, none. You know, I respect the style, but that's not me. So I have to go study and 
try to please other people. Actually, this is the right answer. When I do sessions, I try to please other people, which is the band. I, wanna, I want the band to be as happy as hell. When I do my own bands, I try to please George. And I don't care about anybody else. <laughs> if I can please me and people like it, this is the ultimate thing. If some people don't like what I do, I'm sorry. That's for me. That's my thing, you know? So that's, that's, that's the main difference. And maybe some of the band members. Maybe some of them. Yeah, well, we are a team, obviously. <laughs> obviously, yeah. We have the same, the same vision. Uh, I said it many times. Some people might get it wrong. Oh, you're a diva. You play for you. Of course. What do you want? You want a recipe? What do you want to hear? I'll write seven songs in two hours. You know, that's not honest. The honest thing is like, I grew up as a musician. Like uh, when Metallica uh, released uh, Load, people were like, what is this? Well, that's how they felt. Do you want this? Or you want the same that makes you open the wallet and invest and hear the same thing over and over again like many bands do? I'll take the Metallica way. Just be honest, have fun. If I don't have fun, man, I'll quit. So I have to please me and, you know, uh, our group of people. And I think it's, um, it, it's not a diva thing, it's, uh, it's the honest thing. And I'm so happy when we release something and fans follow and they, they support it. Uh, some other fans are stuck in, uh, in the past. People still tell me like, Annihilation of the Wicked is the best album we did. That's my first album with Nile. For me, it's like the latest album is like all the money. We put so much work, we sound so mature, like there are so many greater things. Not that I don't like Annihilation of the Wicked. It's just, you know, growing and growing and growing. And some people will follow, some other people are stuck in the past. And I'm guilty as well. Uh, for uh, some of my favorite bands, I'll be like, I like until this album, and then I lost the contact. Everybody's like this. You know why? Because you get old. That's why. Not because the band changed. You get old. Or you have great memories from that era, and you're like, that was the best album they ever did. No, to your ears. So I wish fans would grow with us, but if not, I have to, I have to be honest. Make new ones. That's a good uh, approach, yeah. The ability to listen and to feel are connected. The more dynamic you play, the higher the resolution of your ears and sensitivity towards sound. So how did your whole apparatus of your physical ability and how to process it with your ears and your mind and your feel changed over time? The feel in, in drumming, you're saying, yeah, sure. uh, you know, getting going like a more dynamic. Yeah, or even play many notes in a super short time, playing faster and faster. Yeah. You, you must listen faster. Play more dynamic, you must hear more dynamic yeah. in order to do that. So, and you can't do that from the get-go. You have to learn that. That's years, man. That's that's kilometers. You know, I, I playing drums since I was 10 years old. I'm 23 now. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm 46. So a lot of years. So, you know, nothing can beat the time you put on the instrument. Nothing. Absolutely. Like you, you sit down and practice like eight hours a day and the other guy is doing it for like 40 years or 30 years. You know, he's definitely, he's more like tuned uh, over there, you know, than you. I think um, I did practice speed. I'm not gonna lie, of course, you know. Back in the day, I was trying to play faster and faster, but what really did it for me was uh, the band. Just, you know, play with the band, and then you get the energy, and then, of course, you get the ability to hear everything faster and think faster, because if you play like 260 BPM, and you never try to feel, and I'm not talking about feel like a one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, bzzz, okay, and then what are you gonna go? Like snare, tom two, tom three, snare. Like, you could be snare, tom three, tom four, snare, uh, both toms, you know, whatever, you know, that direction, the path, I call it, that's easy. But what if, while you're playing live, you're like, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, you know, and you're like, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, and, you know, on the two, like two bars, and then on the second beat, you get in. So you extend a little bit the feel without have to count it. I just feel it. Um, and if you ask Carl, Scott, and Jules, you know, from, from Nile, they will tell you, Every time we sound check, uh, we play a specific song, 
every day is different. Every single day is different. <laughs> in the beginning, it was a joke. But then I was like, guys, this is training. I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do. I just, you know, the feel. You know, go like all over the place, extend everything, hit the crash on the one E, you know, on the one A, for example. And that helps my creativity a lot. I'm like, oh man. I mean, we did the song. There was no hiccup or train wreck or something, but um, there were a lot of new ideas. So it helps a lot of my creativity, but it adds to that, that thing, the miles we were talking about. Uh, actually, no, we're in Europe, kilometers. So it adds uh, to the experience. So I think to me, it's like uh, playing with a band, playing a lot, a lot of music, you know, and different styles. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> okay, so Phil said, I'm the first artist who appeared on Drum Talk for three times. So that's a world record. Thank you so much, by the way. I always have great fun. I think he rocks it every time. I have really great fun to be here. And uh, do me a favor, go to your music store, the local music store, and try this baby over here. This is the result of a few years of developing, but a lot of love, okay? So do me that favor, go check it out, and see you on the fourth episode, which uh, we're gonna break another record. <laughs>